Lord, he was against sanctions in South Africa. He had voted against every major appropriation that would give students more money, particularly for student loans because of the crisis and the cost of organizing. And we decided to register our campus to vote. There are 4,600 students on ANC's campus. There's another college called Greensboro College just down the street. They got 15,600 students on campus. Even though we had a smaller number of students on our campus, we registered 3,600 or 4,600 students to vote. We became the political power in Jazz. It wasn't easy. First of all, we had to convince students that they must register where they live. Well, where do you live? You live wherever you stayed the last three nights in a row. Now I feel like Bob Barker. <laughs> where do you live? You live wherever you registered, wherever you stayed the last three nights in a row. Once we convinced students of that, we registered 3,600 students to vote. In the following election, once we discovered that Howard Coble won his election by only, he won his election by 60 votes, we attempted to turn our campus out to vote. Okay? So beyond voter registration became voter participation. Howard Coble won the election, but this time he only won by 19 votes. But we had the ear of the congressman. He changed his vote on South Africa. He changed his vote on loans for students. Because those brothers who were all from New York, who swore they were from New York, were now from Greensboro. <laughs> Are you with me? They were brothers from Chicago, were now from Greensboro. And so if you're from Washington State and you go to Idaho State University, or you're from wherever and you go to whatever, you are in, you live where, whatever it is. Isn't that kind of crazy? <laughs> you think someone with my education would know better than that? But anyway, you get the point. Are there any other people who have um, on the issue of getting students involved, some other models that may work? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Which is precisely the point that I wanted to raise about my friend at North Carolina State. I guess I flew past that too quick. He said, Jesse, on North Carolina State's campus, there is a group of American natives who are not getting their grievances addressed. I show up to their meeting and I argue their cause before the black school. He says, there's a group of gay and ra gay rights supporters on our campus. I show up at their meeting and I argue their cause to the administration. He says, the women, whether it's date rape or any number of issues that are of concern to females on campus, I show up and I argue their cause. Well, in the final analysis, when the SGA election came around, they got like a $4 million SGA budget, big one. When the SGA election came around, his silent minority became a political majority because it only required about 600 students to win the election. Are you with me? A silent minority, if you're sensitive and caring, becomes a political majority in any framework, in this room. Silent minority is a political majority. Because what? In our country, everybody doesn't vote, do they? Of course not. Of course we got men in our back. Yes, ma'am. I teach in a predominantly white classroom. How do I get my white students to feel comfortable saying the word black or being <coughs> sensitive to the fact that it's African American or talking about racial and cultural diversity without choking back the word? Okay, I can appreciate that. Um, well, first of all, let me explain. I refer to myself as an African-American and not black. Why do I refer to myself as an African-American? If you look in Roger's Thesaurus, maybe this is a good starting point for you, and you look up the term black, of 132 synonyms for the word black, all are negative. Block, soot, grime, foul. If you tell a little black lie, it's a, if you tell a black lie, it's a big one. If you tell a white one, it's a small one. <laughs> the devil, all of these are negative terms. You look at the same thesaurus and you look up the word white, almost all of the terms are positive. Innocence, purity, chastity. <laughs> Get this one, virginity. <laughs> I thought that did. I am an African American. I am a true hybrid of two cultures and two worlds. Just like, I am not just an African American, I'm African, Afro Native American, but I'll just stick with my African American heritage. I mean, at this time, for the sake of this analysis. I am a true hybrid of two cultures, a 
synthesis of two worlds. I am neither fully American nor am I fully African. I am both African and American, just like Italian Americans, all of whom have a reference point geographically to their heritage, or Greek Americans, or Irish Americans, or British Americans, all of whom have a geographical location from which they have a launching point. Um, and so the correct term for African Americans in our country is African American. Not Afro American, that's a hair <laughs> African American. How do they celebrate someone's diversity in that context? Well, I'm so glad that this Columbus Day we came to appreciate that big lie as what it is, a big lie. And the more we come to terms with history in its fullness and in its truthfulness, the more we become better people. I mean, Anita Hill has made us better today, whether we want to recognize it or not. We're better people today than we were yesterday. Some people are worse, but for the most part, we're better. When we recognize that Columbus didn't find anything, something was here long before Columbus came. Do you know Columbus looked Native American people in the face and just concluded they were not people? I mean, you understand how racist that is? That is what that is. We can call it anything we want to call it, but that is racist. He looked at nations from coast to coast and concluded that he had found something and went back, in other words, and told Europeans, I have discovered something. What a fallacy. When we look at our Constitution, a document that I revere, at the very foundation of that document is a racist and classist and sexist order. The original document, called African American People 350 Human, they did not even qualify as human under the original Constitution. Also, there's a presupposition there that if African Americans are three-fifths human, somebody else must be seven-fifths human, which makes them superhuman, above the law. <laughs> but let's look at it for a minute. The founding fathers who wrote that document, many of whom were religious leaders, many of them ministers, their theology ended up in the document, in the fire analysis. <laughs> These men who wrote this Constitution looked at their fathers, who were also white men, and conclude that their fathers could not vote if they did not own land. Do you know how cold that is? I mean, these are, these are white. This is a fight amongst the white men. So unless you were a property owner as a white male in America at the original inscription of the Constitution, you could not vote. Those same white men looked at their mamas, and because their mamas were female, said they could not vote. Now that's before we even get to the race issue of the Constitution. This is just a fight amongst white folks in America before at the foundation of the country. And this is a truthful view of the Constitution, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in your lawyer. I'm not going to lie to us about July 4th. Let's look at what it is. Okay? Women couldn't vote. African Americans couldn't vote. No political autonomy. Native Americans were not even recognized by the Constitution non-people. Thirteen years after 1776 and 1789, James Madison fought to have a Bill of Rights amended to the Constitution. Because what? The people had concluded, wait a second, we've just finished the Revolutionary War. We have not fought to create a government like the one we've just defeated. We fought to create a government that would allow people to have individual rights, the ability to speak freely, freedom of association, all of those rights that we hold dear today, that we hold at the foundation of our democracy, are those rights that we fought for. Slaves were still not free until the 13th Amendment, 200 and some years later. And then almost 100 and other years later, Jim Crow law, the Jim Crow law, and another 100 years of de facto segregation in the South. And this is the truth about the Constitution. So what is the constitutional process in our country? It is constantly amending. It is constantly reshaping the document to reflect the reality of the American fabric. 
judgment one of the great struggles in our country today and so as we move closer to more realistic interpretations i don't see how we do not become a better nation because then we recognize its flaws and its fallacies and we seek to make it better that's the process that i think we're engaged in follow up yeah because after they accept then and in i teach american government so we're talking about now the proper reference to people of color in this country or whatever when i do have and i do have a couple of people of color in my classes the white kids don't know how to talk about racial issues in front of these kids it's as though they can't get the words out because they're afraid of offending by saying you are african american what does this mean to you or what is it like to be african american in this country they can't arrive at a discussion because they feel like they're being bigoted just by even acknowledging that we are different yeah i can i can appreciate that and i may not i do maybe someone else in the audience please feel free to speak as an answer to that but i can say that from my perspective you know when you read the history book and you see the one paragraph that's devoted to slavery and all the slavery that took place for 400 years in this country it is a source of soreness for many of us that we don't want to recognize it's almost like i saw a movie some time ago where where three of the children were born healthy and one was born mentally retarded and the mentally retarded child was like always the child that was like at home like we didn't recognize the mentally retarded kid because it was like there's a defect in our family genes and if everybody knows then they'll all think we're crazy the things we say are crazy are, are you with me if there, there's a sense of soreness about the issue of slavery just like there's a sense of soreness in that movie that i saw about this child with the mental defect and so let's not recognize let's bury it let's bury it let's let's in light of what's taking place uh let's argue for let's argue for a level playing field in the midst of a constantly uphill ball park let's argue for meritocracy in an institutionalized class and based society let's argue uh in this present academic discourse for race and color blindness in a race and race conscious society and so we have the obligation i would imagine as educators to keep the discourse infused with the reality um uh, i was at another university speaking and uh on the issue of cultural diversity and one of the students said uh um i was trying my best to tell the professors that when you are in a room and there's all white people in there that is the problem you see there are two kinds of racists from my perspective and i use this term both casually and very seriously don't get chill up when i say racist i mean i use it both casually and and seriously there are philosophical racists Aryan nation, Ku Klux Klan, Hitler, Mussolini, philosophical racists. But the vast majority of us, both black and white, are over here in a group that I call cultural racists. That is, we feel good about being in our own group. We feel good at, in, at lunch hour eating at an all-black table. We all gravitate towards an all-black table usually. Or an all, all, you know, we just feel good about being in our group. It happens in institutions all across this country. It happens in law firms. It's not that they consciously do not discriminate against women or minorities. We just feel good about being around a bunch of men on in the legal profession or at the at the judicial level. We feel good about that. And so you can appreciate even within leadership within the African American community how Dr. King is not violent towards this this cultural problem and wants to to reach out to these people who who just have not been exposed to black meat cheese and black this and black that and African American this and all those he wants to But then you got this Malcolm X who, who looks at Dr. King and says, "I cannot see how you can arrive at a non-violent philosophy when these people here want to stamp out my existence." So Malcolm's reaction is to a more philosophical proposition than Dr. King's reaction to a more cultural proposition. But even to explain that discourse to as a professor, as an enlightened person, you're going to be explaining that to many African American students who haven't heard it that way. That's another set of problems that you will confront. Many African American students will say I don't want to be African American. I'm black. Until you superimpose on the discourse, here's Lord Dave Cazar. Look up the term black. Look up the term white. Which one do you want to be? Let the gentleman here want to respond to your question and then we'll move on. Sir, ma'am. Um, well, I want to say with regards to like African American students. Um, okay. <laughs> 
types of racists of which, I, I need this, I qualify this, two types of racists of which both black and white qualify. I want to come talk to you about that. Okay. Um, in regards to the definition of racism, in every 
come from pyramids. I come from leadership and from, from economies and mathematics of scale and geometry. I come from that tradition. I come from science. I am the product of royalty. So I don't understand why everybody goes crazy when they see Princess Di and, and Charles or Chuck. I don't understand that.
this whole Columbus movement, which was just several weeks ago, is the, is the beginning of writing them back into history, of talking about American natives beyond just the fact that they was red and they had bows and arrows and we had guns and we ran them over. At least appreciate you are part of an ongoing development in correcting a historical tradition. <coughs> that has been false. Yes, sir, in the back and the young man right there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an educator, I'm also a teacher, and what I do is in an area of, of equity. And what I might suggest to, to the teacher is that you begin with cross-cultural communication and you also deal specifically with the issue of fear. Because fear is a component that keeps us all separate in terms of our ethnic isolation. So I would suggest that you start there as a result and then go forward. Give the professor a round of applause. This is not supposed to be drill Jesse Jr. hour. <laughs> this is supposed to be participatory. And so if you have an answer to a question that I don't know, raise your hand. At least indicate that you have an answer. Yes, sir, and then yes, ma'am. Feel for them. I empathize with them. And it is not the 
everybody in here to eat fat back. This is part of the experiment. Yes. Yes, ma'am.
programmed to go to jail in Connecticut. The other group is programmed to go to Yale. That is the funding formula of urban education and rural education and suburban education in America right now. Now, we must not pit inner city youth off against suburban youth and suburban youth off against inner city youth. We must fight for what? A more adequately and fairly funded educational system. This gentleman here, then this young lady here, and then you. How do you feel about minority quotas? How do I feel about minority quotas? Good question. This issue has risen to new prominence, obviously, under the context of the Civil Rights Bill. Why affirmative action? Why have affirmative action? Affirmative action is a conservative, not a liberal remedy. It is a conservative remedy for a historically negative problem. The government decides that in order to bring African Americans, women, Hispanics, Native Americans, the traditionally locked out in our country, to a level of parity with the rest of society, the remedy should be that institutions in this country should affirmatively go after these groups that they've historically negatively reacted to. Okay? Now beyond affirmative action, we must get to the issue of what is a substantial remedy for institutions in America to make good on past problems. There comes the issue of quotas. So, you got an institution of 5,000 people. Is one African American a quota at Idaho State University? No. It means that we simply must aggressively recruit African American women and Hispanics and Native Americans the same way we recruit basketball players and football players, aggressively. Quota does not mean hire unqualified people. No, it does not mean that. Quota does not mean hire unqualified airline pilots. We don't need unqualified people flying airplanes, do we? But it does mean if an African American has been historically discriminated against by this corporation, that they should be given serious consideration in terms of employment. And so that's how I feel about that issue. I hope I answered your question. The ob obviously there's a problem with what becomes a sufficient number. I mean, it obviously has to be a percentage based. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir.
be ashamed of who you are. And I discovered, being Jesse Jackson Jr., that it is possible for me to be right and whole groups of people to be wrong. <laughs> are you with me? Are you with me? Whenever I walk into a, when I, went to first, when I first went to the University of Illinois, I'm arrogant. They call me arrogant. They call me insensitive. They call me so much everything. They don't even know that I know that I'm supposed to be in class. But when I go back, <laughs> when I go back to class on Monday and go back to my class and sit next to the people who are black and white, they'll have no idea that I've been here. They'll have no idea what I talked about. They won't know one iota towards any insight into me personally. It's almost, the Bible speaks of it like a prophet is not respected in your own home. Of course, I'm not equating myself with a prophet. I'm far from it, as a matter of fact. Are, are, you, are you with me on that, just on that point so far? The point that I'm trying to make is, first of all, you must affirm within yourself who you are. No one can take that from you. At the same time, you must also recognize that you are part of a continuing struggle. I'm trying to say this in a positive way because I think there's some misrepresentation in terms of, of what that means. Well, you look at a guy like Emmett Till, who just 30 years ago as a 15-year-old black child in Mississippi whistled at a white woman walking down the street and got hung as a 15-year-old child and then drugged to the bottom of the Mississippi River. Then they drug his body out, took him back up to Chicago, and had an open casket funeral for a tremendously disfigured baby. At that time, interracial marriages within our country were unheard of. And the fact that you're a product of interracial marriage you must first and foremost recognize that you must affirm who you are. That's who you are. But you must also appreciate for many African Americans who do not share that very same experience, that they still vividly have the feeling of Emmett Till in their mind at that level. And they will not abandon that because it's a very much a real part of their reality. In Chicago, a black man walking down the street with a white woman today is still harassed. Maybe not nine folks. Well, yeah, it happened in Chicago, where I'm from. And so, as an attractive young lady, which you are, that's a problem for some people. And yet, because you're an American, you have the option to see and date and be with whoever you want to be with. Freedom of association, that's your First Amendment right as well. But you have a unique history. And you'll become more intelligent and a much better person when you appreciate and embrace both parts of that history. That's your time.
Give them both a round of applause. Yes. Yes. I think that she's got, I mean, she is a part of two really beautiful things and that she, there is no way that she should be ashamed of that. Give her a round of applause.
shut down completely because mostly I see this because I'm a high school dropout. I'm not allowed in stores in my community. I'm not allowed in churches in my community because of my appearance. I've done more working in the past month than the mayor, the police chief, or most other people in our community. And I cannot understand why they can't accept my hard work. Give him a round of applause. Right. 
is not equal. It's unequal. And it's unfair. And it's inadequate funding. We're beyond that now. But that does not deny that African American men need access to African American males who are doing it, who are making it, who are progressing in the society, and who are fighting against great odds. It doesn't mean they give up on the fight. It means they continue to fight. But they can continue it through the system, with the system, by making America better. Not by recognizing that it's all wrong. Yes, there's a lot wrong with it. But we constantly fight to make it better. That's the difference between being proactive and being reactive. This question, and then we'll go into the section. I'd just like to say that I feel like I've been corrupted by my education. In Missouri, I lived there for three years. And in that time, everyone knew the Ku Klux Klan, but no one ever knew what it was. The area was mostly black, and I never even knew that there was a problem or a difference between the two until I moved up here and learned through school and through history classes that there was a difference. Give them a round of applause. Yes, sir.
intent is supposed to take that little bit of information, and if they're really educated, if they're really informed, if they're really creative, they should take that information back to the disinherited 90th and uplift their community. Their community is supposed to become better because you're in here, not because, not worse, and you should not develop an attitude that looks down on that community. Yes. All right, are we together?